In this lesson, we're going to apply the things that we've learned about recursive functions to questions in logic. And to do that, because logic doesn't really say anything in and of itself about numbers and functions and things, we're going to need to look at particular theories expressed in the language of logic. We've got to look at what logic says about numbers, about arithmetic. Now, logic by itself says nothing about numbers, but we can have theories of numbers expressed in the language of logic. And so let's revise and look back at the things that we've said about theories. Remember, a theory is a set of formulas where any consequence of that set of formulas was already in the set. So it's a set of formulas that is, as we say, closed under its own consequences. Now, given that this is a set and the issue of whether or not something is in that set is something that we can ask, we can think about when a theory might be decidable, when that issue or that question can be answered in a recursive manner. The flip side of that is that there might be some theories where the answer to that question is undecidable where there is no algorithm, no process for determining the answer to the question, is this formula in the theory? So we'll take a look at some ways that you might show that a theory was decidable so that we can get a sense of where those things might not apply and where we can look for undecidable theories. First example, uh, a theory is deductively defined if and only if the set of sentences is a set of consequences of some finite set of axioms or some recursive set of axioms. Lots of theories that you might think, consider have this form. You've got some collection of fundamental principles. They're the axioms. And we say that anything's in the theory if it is a consequence of those axioms. The key idea is that the question, are you an axiom, can be decided by some recursive process. We can always have a definitive answer to the question, is this an axiom? But then the question about whether something's in the theory might be harder to answer. But something's in the theory if it's a consequence of the axioms. That's what we call a deductively defined theory. We've already seen one example of a deductively defined theory. This is a theory of Robinson's arithmetic, which has seven axioms. Seven's very finite. You can always see whether a formula is one of the axioms or not. No problem with that. And we say that the theory is all of the sentences in the language of arithmetic, which follow by means of logic alone from these seven axioms. This is the theory that we'll call Q for short, and we'll write that A follows from Q if we can prove A using axioms from Q as the only undischarged assumptions in our proof. This is a deductively defined theory. There's plenty of other sorts of deductively defined theories. You especially find these things in mathematics. A nice simple example is in this elegant paper by Alfred Tarski and Stephen Gavant um, concerning an axiomatization of a theory of geometry, which is all about points and lines and things like that. But there's no requirement that this just be about mathematical things. Any deductively defined theory is just something where you get some fundamental principles and then look at all of, its, all of the consequences of those principles using some logic. Now, a neat fact about deductively defined theories is that a deductively defined theory is always recursively enumerable if we've got some way of recursively generating all of the proofs from the axioms of the theory. So if your language is countable, and they almost always are, and if the logic of the theory is just standard predicate logic, we can recursively generate all of the proofs from the axioms of a deductively defined theory. We've already seen you can enumerate all of the proofs in the language of predicate logic, and that's a recursive function that can generate that. And you can just delete from that uh, list that you've generated all of the proofs which use other axioms. And so you get a recursive, uh, because the set of axioms is itself recursive, you can decide whether or not something is an axiom. That's never you know, a judgment call. It's always obvious whether or not something is an axiom. That's the definition of, of being deductively defined. Then 
we've got our recursive enumeration of all of the proofs. And so given that when you have a proof, you just check the root of the proof, and that is what the proof is a proof of, you can recursively enumerate the members of the theory. Now, as we've seen, that doesn't mean that the theory's membership is recursive. It's just that we can recursively enumerate those things. That means if something is in the theory, we can get definitive proof that it's in the theory. It doesn't mean the reverse. If something is not in the theory, we may not get definitive proof that it's not in that theory. That's harder. Now, if the theory's membership is recursive, if we can test for membership in that theory using some recursive function, then we'll say that the theory is decidable. That's another uh, commonly used word for this. So you'll hear me talking about decidable theories. These are theories where we've got some recursive process or recursive function, which returns yes or no, where, um, where it returns yes if something's in the theory and no if it isn't. And because it's recursive, that's guaranteed to terminate. Uh, so we'll always get an answer. We'll never be left hanging. We might be left hanging for a very long period of time, but we'll never be left hanging forever. And so this is a really interesting question for theories. Uh, which theories are genuinely recursive in that sense? Which theories are decidable? Are there undecidable theories? We've already seen examples of decidable theories. If the logic is just propositional logic, so we've just got you know P's, Q's, and R's, and 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 or and not, and things like that and we only have a finite set of axioms, then the theory is decidable. You test for membership in the theory just by doing a truth table, and that's always a finite test. So that's a, a simple baseline for decidable theories. A propositional logic theory with a finite set of axioms, that's decidable. How about theories in the language of predicate logic? Here, I'm going to give you one example of a class of theories that's also decidable. A theory is said to have the finite model property if and only if whenever a formula isn't in the theory, that means you can't prove that formula A from the theory T, and then the completeness theorem tells us that there's a model where the theory is true and A isn't. The theory has the finite model property if one of these counterexample models is finite. So to have the finite model property, it's not sufficient for the theory to just have some finite models, but the finite models can do the job of showing that things aren't in the theory. For anything that isn't in the theory, there's a finite counterexample. Now, this is a really strong condition. Uh, Robinson's arithmetic, for example, doesn't have the finite model property. As we'll see, in fact, it has no finite models at all. But other theories do have the finite model property. Now, a neat thing is, if my theory is deductively defined, and it only has finitely many things in its vocabulary, so only finitely many names, predicates, function symbols, things like that, and it has the finite model property, then the theory has to be decidable. And here's why. I'm going to give you an algorithm, a recursive process, for checking whether or not A is a theorem in the theory. So if you've got a formula A and you want to know whether it's a theorem or not, you do two things at once. On the one hand, you enumerate your theory. It's recursively enumerable. We've already seen that because it's deductively defined. We just spit out all of the members of the theory one by one by one by one. Then on the other hand, you can enumerate the finite models of my theory. There's only finitely many models of size one because there's only basically take the domain containing one thing and look at all of the different ways of interpreting the finitely many other bits of vocabulary my theory's got. Then do the same thing for all the theories of size two. It's going to be a lot more than that than there were theories of size one, but it's still finite. Then the theories of size three, then the theories of size four, etc. So with my formula A, as I am generating all of the theorems on the one hand, I'll just check and see if A appears on that list. On the other hand, as these models are coming off the assembly line, I check the status of A in each of those models. Because the models are finite, that check will only take finitely long. So because A, uh, because the theory has the finite model property, either A is going to list, appear on the list of theorems, or there's going to be some finite counterexample that we get. So 
we check for i on the list of theorems and check for the models to see if they refute i. If i is in the theorem, if i is a theorem, it'll appear on that list of theorems sometimes. And if i isn't, it'll be refuted by one of the finite models. So eventually, you get your answer. For any formula A, the question, is this, a mem is this in the theory, can get a definitive answer eventually. So the finite model property for deductively defined theories with a finite vocabulary is another class of decidable theories. Now, that was one example of where we did this sort of two-stage process. Uh, on the one hand, checking for membership in the theory, and on the other hand, checking for being able to refute something that's in the theory. This gives me another idea for another way of showing that a theory is decidable, and that's if the theory is complete. Remember, a theory is complete if for every formula A, it either contains A or not A. So it, it decides everything one way or another, not in the sense that we have an algorithm for determining what the answer is, but the theory has the answer, yes or no, for each thing. And so a theory is complete and it's consistent if it contains exactly one of the yes or no answers, because clearly if the theory said yes and it said no to the same thing, then the theory is inconsistent. So now, if my theory is consistent and complete, you can see how I could do the same sort of two-stage process for figuring out whether or not something is a member of the theory, not by looking at all of the things which are in the theory on the one hand and all of the counterexamples, the models uh, that would refute things on the other, but rather we just look at all of the things that are in the theory recursively enumerated one by one and to test whether something is in the is in the theory or not i just list those things one by one if the formula a turns up in my list i know it's in the theory but if not a turns up i know that a isn't in the theory and because the theory is complete, one of A or not A has to turn up. So we just wait. So we just have a relax while all of the theorems are being generated, and we just check which comes first, A or not A. Because it's consistent, only one of those will come up. Because it's complete, at least one of those will come up. And so that's how we answer the question, are you a theorem? You just generate all of the theorems and see which comes first, A or not A. Now, for this to work, the theory has to be complete, and most theories aren't. Most theories are not so determinate to decide every issue one way or another. So this is another nice limit point for how we can find um, uh, decidable theories, but this has given us lots of room to move for theories that are not decidable. They're theories that are not just in propositional logic, they don't have the finite model property, or maybe they've got a larger vocabulary than just finite, and they're not complete. That's the kind of space that we've got to work with to find undecidable theories. Turns out a heck of a lot of theories are in that space. And arithmetic, theories of numbers, are definitely in that space. So to refresh your memory about theories of arithmetic, quite simple. The language of arithmetic contains one constant, one name, uh, which I'll write with a zero with an underline to, be, to distinguish that from zero uh, without an underline, which is the notation that I will use for the actual number zero. So when I'm focusing on the syntax of the language, I'll use the underline. When I'm focusing on the thing that that syntax names, or at least we want it to name, in the intended model for the language of arithmetic, that's where we'll use the name without the underline. The only predicate that we use is the identity predicate, the equality predicate with the equal signs. And we've got three function symbols, the successor function, which is a one place function, which we'll notate with a prime, and addition and multiplication, which are two place functions, plus and times. And so the terms are the things that we make out of the name and the function symbols. And so, you know, zero prime is a term, so zero prime prime, zero prime prime prime, these are all terms. And so is zero prime plus zero prime prime, 
uh, zero prime prime times zero prime 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 plus zero with a hell of a lot of primes and so on. It gets very tedious writing down all of these zeros and primes and we'll soon give this up because we've got other nice notations already for these things. What is zero plus one? Well, it's just one. Zero prime prime is two and so on. And so a shorthand that I'll use for zero prime will be a one with an underline. Zero prime prime will be abbreviated by a two with an underline and so on. In general, n for any number n with an underline is the term which, if you write it out fully, is a zero with an underline followed by n primes after it. So we've got this formal and precise notation inside the language of arithmetic for absolutely every number that we might want to use when we're talking about whole counting numbers. Zero and its successor, and for any number, we've also got the successor of that number. So we've got names for all of the whole numbers. And then we can stick these names together to make statements. And so if I say 2 plus 2 is 4, that's written uh, officially as this. 0 prime prime plus 0 prime prime equals 0 prime 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 prime. And like I said, that gets tedious. The shorthand that we'll use for that is 2 plus 2 is 4. But the key idea here is none of the things that you know about addition, multiplication, using techniques for adding and multiplying that you might have learned in school, which utilize the decimal numbers, the decimal numerals and everything, none of that is in our theory because the theory doesn't use the numerals. The theory only uses a name for the number zero, and then the idea of a successor. And everything else uh, that we use in our notation is just our shorthand for representing this fundamental syntax. And what are the axioms of Robinson's arithmetic? Well, here's the first three. These are axioms which just govern the zero and the successor notion. Q1 says if two numbers have the same successor, then they're the same. If x successor is y successor, the only way that can happen is if x equals y. The next uh, axiom, Q2, says that for any number at all, zero is not, the is not that number's successor. So zero is not a successor of anything. And finally, if you're not zero, then you are the successor of something. Any number other than zero is the successor of some number. So let's see how we can use Q1 and Q2 to prove that one does not equal two. Remember, one is the successor of zero, and two is the successor of the successor of zero. So to prove this, I'll first use the Q1 axiom, because that will tell us that if 1 equals 2, then 0 has to equal 1. Now, Q1 is a universally quantified axiom, and so the inference from Q1 to this instance is a couple of steps of universal quantifier elimination. Now, the Q2 axiom will tell us that 0 is not the successor of anything. In particular, it's not the successor of zero. So we can see how we can prove that one isn't two by assuming that one is two and using our consequence of the Q1 axiom to tell us that, well, if that was the case, then zero would be uh, identical to one and then get a contradiction from the fact that zero is not identical to one. And we'll blame that on the assumption that one was identical to two. And that's our proof, which tells us that 1 is not identical to 2, follows from the axioms Q1 and Q2. Now, you can see it gets a little bit tedious and hard to read with all this 0 prime, 0 prime, prime, etc., rather than 1 and 2. I could instead have written 1 and 2 instead of 0 prime and 0 prime, prime, in this proof, but then it gets a little bit harder to see how these things are instances of the axioms. So it's a bit of a trade-off.
Now that little proof that we just saw is an example of a much more general phenomenon. If n and m are different numbers, then we could just grind through the axioms q1 and q2 to show that uh, n does not equal m follows from our ax those two axioms. Now it's a neat fact here that uh, immediately follows from this that the models for q1 and q2 have got to have infinite domains because we've got infinitely many terms 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 which are just 0 with a bunch of successes after them and this fact that we just indicated here tells us all of those have got to name different things. So this theory has got no finite models even if we just had the first two axioms 1 and 2. Now, Q3 uh, is playing a very important function. It tells us that zero is the only thing which isn't a successor. Everything else has got to arise out of being a successor of something. Now, you might think, well, that should be obvious because the only names we've got are zero, one, two, three, four, etc., and everything other than zero uh, is a successor. That's what its name says. But remember, there's nothing in this theory that says that everything has to have a name. Uh, this theory has got models where there are other numbers other than the numbers that we are naming uh, using these names. But at the very least, these three axioms are going to tell us that we've got a sequence big enough to do arithmetic. There's at least a first thing, and there's, there's at least a successor for each of those things uh, that are in uh, that sequence, as it were. And so we've got enough objects to do arithmetic with. So, and that's what the other axioms do, is that they give us some tools to actually add and multiply. So here's the addition axioms, uh, just two of them. One says how you add zero, and the other says how you add a successor. And we know that every object is either zero or a successor, so this should pin down the interpretation of addition, and it does to a certain extent. Let's use these axioms to prove that one plus two equals three. To start, Q5 tells us that one plus two is the successor of one plus one. Now this notation is getting a little bit tedious, so I'll replace that zero prime and zero prime prime with one and two. So to figure out what one plus two is, we need to figure out what one plus one is, and Q5 will tell us that one plus one is the successor of one plus zero. Now Q4 tells us that one plus zero is one, so we'll use that to show that one plus one is two, the successor of one. This inference here is using an identity elimination because we know that 1 plus 0 is 1, that's Q4, and so we can replace something involving 1 plus 0, that's the bit inside the brackets there, by a 1, and so that's been shifted out. The 1 plus 0 has been replaced by a 1, and so successor of 1 plus 0 is the successor of 1. But our notation for that is 2, so let's replace that one successor by 2, now that we know what that step is doing. And then we can do exactly the same sort of move here. 1 plus 1 is featuring over on uh, this step, that 1 plus 2 is the successor of 1 plus 1, and we can replace that 1 plus 1 by 2, since 1 plus 1 equals 2. And as before, this 2 successor that appears in the conclusion, well, another way of writing that is 3. So we've got our proof showing that 1 plus 2 is 3, just using two instances of the Q5 axiom and one instance of the Q4 axiom. Multiplication is pretty much the same deal, two axioms, one involving the uh, multiplication by 0, x times 0 is 0, and the other showing how to multiply a successor, x times the successor of y is just x times y plus x. This is what makes multiplication repeated addition in just the same way that addition is just repeated taking the successor. So we can use these axioms to prove basic arithmetical claims like 2 plus 2 is 4. Let me do that reasonably quickly. In the interest of speed, I'm, my notation is going to be a little bit sloppy. I'm going to get rid of the underlines to write this fairly quickly. Now the Q7 axiom tells us that 2 times 2 is 2 times 1 plus 2. So if I could prove that 2 times 1 is 2, then I'll get 2 times 2 is 2 plus 2, 
And we already know how to prove basic addition facts like 2 plus 2 is 4, so that would give us that 2 times 2 is 4. So we've got to prove that 2 times 1 is 2. Well, Q7 tells us that 2 times 1 is 2 times 0 plus 2. And, well, Q6 tells us that 2 times 0 is 0. So we're going to put these things together to tell us that 2 times 1 is 0 plus 2. Now, we wanted to show that 2 times 1 is 2. And to get that from 2 times 1 is 0 plus 2, we've got to prove that 0 plus 2 is 2. But that's another basic addition fact, and we know how to prove those. So here's the main structure of our proof. We proved that 2 times 2 is 4 using two lots of Q7 and a Q6. And we left out the bits of addition that this depends on. So you can see that the multiplication axioms are a bit more complicated than the addition axioms because they depend on uh, this addition here, which you need to use the addition axioms to deal with. But still, we can use these axioms together with uh, Q5 and Q4 to prove basic multiplication facts. Let me explain the kinds of things that you can prove in that style. Uh, the vocabulary that we'll use is that uh, we're dealing with numerical terms here, where 0 is a numerical term. If t is a numerical term, so is t with a prime after it. And we'll say that uh, the term 0 stands for the number 0. And if a term stands for a number, then the term with a prime after it stands for the next number. This is just an obvious uh, vocabulary that we'll use for the number that the term is meant to be out. And if T1 and T2 are numerical terms, then so is T1 plus T2 with brackets around it and T1 times T2 with brackets around it. And if T1 stands for N1 and T2 stands for N2, then the term T1 plus T2 stands for the actual number that you get when you add N1 and N2. And the term T1 times T2 stands for the number that you get when you multiply N1 and N2. So the idea is that terms are bits of the language, and they've got brackets inside. They've got symbols like plus and times and whatever. The numbers don't. The numbers are just numbers that are out there in Plato's heaven or whatever you think numbers are. But the idea is that each term, which is made up out of the name zero and successor and plus and times, picks out or stands for a given number. And there are no other numerical terms than these. Uh, so, for example, 0 prime plus 0 prime prime prime, all primed is a numerical term which stands for 5. But if I've got variables in, like x prime plus y prime prime prime, all prime, that's not a numerical term because it's got free variables. Now, a neat fact is that if I've got two numerical terms, Q proves the identity between them if T1 and T2 stand for the same number. And Q proves the negation of that if T2, T1 and T2 stand for different numbers. And you can prove this first by showing that if the term T1 stands for the number n, then Q proves T1 equals n where now we've got the numerical term for n, which is just zero with the right number of primes after it. You prove that by doing the basic calculation steps in using the axioms Q4, Q5, Q6, Q7 to simplify out uh, pluses and times and to replace them just by the repeated successes that they represent. And then you can show that Q proves N is not equal to M whenever N and M are different. That's just using the axioms Q1 and Q2. Q2 says that 0 is not a successor. And Q1 tells us how to delete successor symbols from both sides of an identity. And so if N and M are different numbers, then the term N and the term M are zeros with different numbers of successors behind them. So you delete whichever has got the fewest. And so you'll have zero successor symbols on one side and a whole number on the other. And so Q proves that that's false. Then if T1 stands for N and T2 stands for M, uh, Q tells us that T1 is identical to N, is the same number as N. 
and Q proves that T2 is the same number as M. So if N and M are the same by transitivity of identity, Q will tell us that T1 is T2. And if N and M are different numbers, Q will tell us that T1 has got to be a different number than T2. So, uh, so Q is really smart at individual numerical terms. Q, in other words, can do primary school mathematics. Any kind of calculation involving numerical terms, any kinds of addition and multiplication of numbers of any size, Q can do. And it's omniscient about that. Any true facts involving terms, it gets right. Uh, any true identities it can prove and any true negations of identities it can prove. So you might think, what can't Q prove? Well, what Q can't prove is generalizations of them. Uh, Q clearly can't prove that it's not the case that for every X, for every Y, X plus Y equals Y plus X, because there's a model, the standard model, the counting numbers interpreted in the usual way, in which the generalization for every X, for every Y, X plus Y equals Y plus X turns out to be true. So clearly, Q doesn't prove this negation, and nor would we want it to. Q doesn't prove that it's not the case that for every X, for every Y, X plus Y equals Y plus X. The problem is, Q also doesn't prove the thing that we negated. Now, I'm not going to go through that here. We'll talk about this in class. Uh, we can find a model for all of the Q axioms in which there are objects in the domain where A plus B is not the same thing as B plus A. Now, these have got to be other things which got in the domain, which weren't, you know, zero prime, zero prime prime, zero prime prime, the things that the numerical terms name. Because if A and B were numerical terms, we would prove that A plus B uh, has got to name the same thing as B plus A. It's just got to be whatever the number is uh, that those two terms name. But there can be other things in the domain of Q models, uh, and we'll see this in class. Uh, that tells us that Q doesn't prove that generalization. Q doesn't prove that addition is commutative. You can't prove in Q that for every X, for every Y, X plus Y equals Y plus X. It's really great at individual facts. It's much less great at generalizations about those facts. So it's very important to, uh, to keep straight in your head and uh, we'll, we'll do some exercises in class which will help you with this. It's very important to distinguish this universal fact for every x for every y, x plus y equals y plus x, which Q can't prove from each of its instances in numerical terms, which Q can prove. The, the reason there's a gap between this is that Q can't prove that everything is named by some numerical term, and nor should it. Q doesn't have any way of saying that fact. That's a kind of infinitely long sentence to say. It says for every x, x is either 0 or 1 or 2 or 3 or 4 or 5 or 6 or 7. Now, either I say this with a dot, dot, dot at the end and you can kind of get what I mean, or the statement is infinitely long. And that's not a sentence that's in the language of Q. Now, this has made mathematicians think, I need to have a better way of explaining how we can prove generalizations. And there's ways of extending Robinson's arithmetic to have more axioms so that we can prove general statements. And an obvious way of doing this is using the fact that the numbers are just zero and the successes of numbers that we've already got. And then we can prove that all numbers have got some property by proving that zero's got that property. And if a number's got that property, then so does the successor of that number. That way of proving things about numbers is not represented at all in the axioms of Robinson's arithmetic. There's nothing about how to prove an arbitrary generalization about numbers. It's this principle of induction is what you add to Robinson's arithmetic to get a stronger theory called piano arithmetic. Piano arithmetic adds to Robinson's arithmetic uh, a whole bunch of new axioms. It's every formula which has this shape here. If phi holds of zero and whenever phi holds of x, phi holds of x prime, 
if those two things hold, then phi holds of every number. This is called a, a family of axioms because we have an instance for every different formula phi with a free variable x inside. Piano arithmetic, PA, is a much stronger theory than Robinson's arithmetic. For example, you can prove that addition is commutative. I won't go through all of the proof, but I'll sketch how it works here. First, think of the, the property x plus 0 equals 0 plus x. You know, think of this as a property which we know holds of 1, it holds of 0, it holds of 5. Because for each of these things, you know, 5 plus 0 is 0 plus 5, 1 plus 0 is 0 plus 1, etc. Well, we're going to prove that this holds of every number by induction. PA definitely proves that 0 plus 0 equals 0 plus 0, so we've proved phi 0. And PA also proves for every x, if x plus 0 equals 0 plus x, then x prime plus 0 equals 0 plus x prime. That requires a little bit of work, but you can see first that PA proves that x plus 0 is x. That's one of the instance, that's the, the first addition axiom. And uh, it also proves x prime plus 0 equals x prime. That's another instance. And it proves that 0 plus x prime equals 0 plus x or prime by Q5. So chaining all of those things together, we get that if x plus 0 equals 0 plus x, then x prime plus 0 equals 0 plus x prime. So we can appeal to the induction axiom where phi of x is x plus 0 equals 0 plus x to conclude that this holds for every number. Now we're going to treat that as a base case of another induction. Uh, let psi of y be for every x, x plus y equals y plus x then we've proved psi of zero. That's what we've just done. Then it's a little bit more work, but you can do this using the piano axioms. Uh, we can prove for every y that if for every x, x plus y equals y plus x, then for every x, x plus y prime equals y prime plus x. And once you've done that, then you will get the conclusion that psi holds of every number, every number y, so you'll get for every y, for every x, x plus y equals y plus x. So this is a much stronger uh, theory of uh, arithmetic because you can prove more generalizations like that. Now we've got a couple of arithmetic theories. We've got Robinson's arithmetic and piano arithmetic. Uh, piano much stronger than Robinson. And we've got things about recursive functions uh, that we've proved. And we're now going to connect these things together a little bit more intimately. And we're going to look at the kinds of functions that these arithmetic theories can represent. Now, Q explicitly represents functions like successor, addition, and multiplication. It's got symbols for them in the language. It can represent more things than just those functions. It can represent the, the one-place function of multiplication by 2 just using the term x times 2. And it can do other things just using function symbols, numerals, variables, jamming them all together, and you can get more complicated things. But there's plenty of functions that you can't just construct by jamming together numerals, function symbols, and variables. But we've got more things in the language than that. We've got the logical connectives and the quantifiers, so let's use them. Think of what it is to be the remainder when something is divided by 2. I can divide 2 into 8 without any remainder, so the remainder uh, when 8 is divided by 2 is 0. Whereas when I divide 9 by 2, I've got 1 left over. It's got a remainder of 1. Now I've got a way of formally specifying in my language what it is for y to be the remainder when x is divided by 2 with this sentence. Either there's some z such that x is z times 2, so then, z, then x is even, and then the remainder, y, is 0. Or there's some z where x is z times 2 plus 1, and then, in that case, the remainder, y, is 1. This formula is a sort of specification of the remainder function. It's got two free variables, x and y, uses a bound variable z to connect them, and it represents the statement y is the remainder when x is divided by 2. And the theory of Robinson's arithmetic is strong enough to be able to prove to us that this does what we want it to do.
Q proves the instance where we substitute 0 for y when I substitute an even numeral in place of x. So here I've substituted 6 for x and 0 for y. The instance that I get is this formula, and you can see we can prove the left disjunct because it's very easy to prove that 6 is 3 times 2 and 0 equals 0, and so we can ignore the right disjunct, which is going to be very hard to prove because we can't prove that 0 equals 1. And that worked for 6, and it would work for 8, and it would work for 174, and it would work for any other even numeral that you substituted in. Similarly, if I substitute an odd numeral in place of x, q will prove the instance where we substitute 1 for y. Now it's going to be really hard to prove the left disjunct, because you can't prove that 1 equals 0, whereas you can prove the right disjunct, because there is a z, namely 3, where 7 is 3 times 2 plus 1, and it's very easy to prove that 1 equals 1. So if you've got a more generous way of describing functions, which not only uh, uses function symbols and variables and terms mashed together, but also uses the rest of the language and gives you a description of what you want the function to do. In general, a uh, three-place function will have a description with four variables, three for the input numbers and one for the output number, and so on for, for functions of different arity then it turns out the language of arithmetic has got the resources to describe, to represent a lot more. Here's the general definition of representation uh, that that was an instance of. Given an n place function, the open formula with n plus 1 variables, a bunch of x's and then the y, is said to represent the function in the theory t just when, whenever m is the result of applying the function to the ends, then the theory can prove for every y, phi holds of the ends and y if and only if y is m. So the thing that we have to prove for our function, which returns 1 when its input is odd and 0 when its input is even, to show that that is represented by the formula that we were looking at, we need to prove whenever n is odd, uh, this formula here. And whenever n is even, we need to prove this formula here. This tells us when the input specified, the open formula describes a unique output. And, and the unique output in particular is actually what we want the output of the function to be. Now, we could spend a lot of time, if we knew more mathematics, talking about representability. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to point you to two amazing facts, one of which you can sort of get a hint of why it's true, and the other requires a fair bit of mathematics to go through and prove. The first fact is that if f is a recursive function, Robinson's arithmetic can represent it. The second is that if Robinson's arithmetic represents a function, then that function has to be recursive. For the second fact, you need to extract from the proofs of each of these instances of the description formula in Robinson's arithmetic an algorithm uh, for deciding the, the function. And for the reverse, the, the first point here, that if a function is recursive, then Robinson's arithmetic represents it. You can show that the basic functions are represented in Robinson's arithmetic. You can show that the composition of functions that are represented in Robinson's arithmetic is also represented. You can show that the minimization of a function is representable in Robinson's arithmetic if that function is. What's harder and needs a little bit more mathematics is showing that if functions f and g are representable, then so is their primitive recursion. That requires a little bit of arithmetic, in particular showing that the Chinese remainder theorem uh, is provable in Robinson's arithmetic, and that would take us a whole extra week to do. So I'm just going to claim this. You can look up the proof in a book. Uh, it's interesting, but it's more mathematics than we really need. Uh, so I'm just going to steal that result and go on. Before we end today's class, I want to think about one more way that the language of arithmetic allows us to represent things, because we'll also find this very useful.
Uh, the language of arithmetic can not only represent functions like we did, uh, you might think an even more natural thing to, to, to have is that it can represent sets. If I have a, a formula with a free variable in, like the formula B that I'm mentioning here, we'll say that a set of numbers n is definable by that formula according to a given theory t, if and only if t proves b of n, if and only if that number n is in the set, and t proves not b of n, if and only if that number is not in the set. So this is a formula where proofs of instances can be used to settle membership in or out. Uh, that's a nice way of thinking of formulas as describing sets of numbers. And it turns out that some sets of numbers are, can be described using these formulas that we've got. It turns out that there's going to be other sets of numbers which can't be so described. And there's a connection between uh, formulas that can be described or defined in this way and uh, functions. And that is that the sets which are definable are exactly the recursive sets. Remember, a set is recursive if its characteristic function is recursive. And that means it's a function which returns 1 when the input's in the set and 0 when the input's not in the set. Well, if the characteristic function fn of a set is a recursive set, sorry, is a recursive function, then if i represents that function, then i of x and 1 uh, defines the set. That is a description which is true of objects, true of numbers when they're in the set, and is false of numbers when they're not in the set, and the theory can prove that. The theory can prove i of n and 1 when uh, n is in the set, and it can prove not i of n and 1 when the, uh, the number n is not in the set. So we've got this nice little connection here, the definable sets in Robinson's arithmetic and in piano arithmetic are recursive. And we're going to use that next week as we begin to use diagonalization and other phenomena to turn arithmetic in on itself, to give it a way of describing its own limits. And then from that, we'll see that these results also apply to logic as a whole. But that is for next week.